This is a reading from Psalm 51. A Psalm of David when the prophet Nathan came to him after David had committed idolatry with Bathsheba. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict. And justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Yet you desired faithfulness even in the womb. You taught me wisdom in the secret place. Cleanse me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will teach transgressions, transgressors your ways so that sinners will turn back to you. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God, you who are God my Savior. And my tongue will sing of your righteousness. Open my lips, Lord, and my mouth will declare your praise. You do not delight in sacrifice, or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. My sacrifice, O oh God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart you, God, will not despise. May it please you to prosper Zion, to build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in the sacrifices of the righteous, in burnt offerings offered whole, then bulls will be offered on your altar. As Psalm 51 still rings in our ears, perhaps we can reflect on these thoughts from Eugene Peterson. Untutored, we tend to think that prayer is what good people do when they are doing their best. It is not. In experience, we suppose that there must be an insider language that must be acquired before God takes us seriously in our prayer. There is not. Prayer is elemental, not advanced language. It is the means by which our language becomes honest, true, and personal in response to God. It is the means by which we get everything in our lives out in the open before God. So many of the psalms that we engage with in this, in this 150 options that you have are attributed to King David, uh, the, the great king of Israel, the sort of hero of this middle period of the Old Testament, this great king. It's interesting, however, that, that because of this great king and, and so many psalms that, that bear his name, naturally, as you might imagine, there's interest in David. So his story takes up a lot of the Old Testament. You find the books of 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel, and then again, even his influence leading into the later at books of the Kings and Chronicles, you see the influence of this great king. And he has a fascinating history with stories that you probably have heard of before. Stories of David and Goliath, the kind of story that you don't really need to even have a religious background to have encountered that even the terminology of David and Goliath being used. What for me is interesting about, about the story of David actually speaks to a larger sense of how the Bible tells stories about its heroes. And one of the things that you'll notice is the Bible tells pretty kind of broadly open stories about its heroes to a way that I think in our contemporary context we'd be a little uncomfortable with. I, I, when we read the story of David, you might think, would a modern politician want to tell the story of their life the way that the Bible tells the story of its king's lives? It seems to me that generally speaking what happens is our modern politic is to kind of curate your history quite well. 
It seems to be that there's like, you know, you can be running for some sort of political position and then people find out something that you did some time back, you know, either in person or something you said on Twitter or so, you know, and all of a sudden your whole political career can become under threat. And and now I realize in Canada, we never refer to what our politicians used to do as in any way um, significant to their current roles, right? But in other parts of the world, they do. (laughs) What's fascinating about the story of David is that in the middle of his story, in, in, first, in 2 Samuel chapter 11, you get this, this horrendous story of his behavior that is told in, in quite some detail. And it, it sort of shocks us at some level when we're used to whitewashed stories or heavily curated stories or denials of wrongdoing when politicians are younger. It, it's kind of interesting and, and, and strange to read this very open expose at some level of this king's behavior. And what happens is that David is, is found one night, the Bible tells us in, in, in 2 Samuel chapter 11 that he's found one night relaxing on his roof. Uh, and the Bible throws in this little throwaway line, and you can read the whole story in your, in your own time if you want to, but the Bible throws in, the intros the story with this little interesting line where it says, David was on the roof relaxing at the time of year when the kings were normally at war. So, so the whole story begins with David being somewhere he probably shouldn't be. He should be over here, but actually he's there. And I wonder how many of our own stories of of things falling apart on us begin with us just simply being somewhere that we shouldn't be. David's relaxing on his roof. You assume it's a pleasant evening. He's outside. And as he looks across the rooftops of, of his city, he notices a lady bathing on her roof. Now, as somebody who lives in Alberta, I can never imagine the roof being a safe place to bathe. Uh, you know, I don't know, three days of the year, it's warm enough to go outside without a sweater. So, you know, but apparently that's how it worked in those days. And this was probably not entirely abnormal behavior. But David sees this lady and he is, he is drawn to her and is attracted to her. So he sends uh, one of his servants to go in and bring her to him. He brings her to him, uh, to his bedroom, and they spend the evening together. I don't know the age range of everyone in the room, so I'm being careful with my words. Um, They spend the evening together, and and then she, she goes home, and she gets in touch with him shortly afterwards to tell him that she is pregnant. This is a problem for David, and, and he, he perceives this as a problem, but he very quickly then decides that he can, he can sort of sort this situation out. So he gets in touch with the war front where his general is because he knows that her husband, Uriah, is part of his army. And he suggests that Uriah should come home. And his theory is if we give Uriah a week of leave with his wife, then nobody will be suspicious of my involvement in this particular story. The problem of the story is that Uriah has a much better moral code than David has at this particular moment moment. And Uriah says, you know, wait a minute, this would be wrong. I can't come back and have a week's leave with my wife while all of my fellow soldiers are are fighting and, and potentially dying on a war front. So he comes back because the king has told him to, but refuses to stay at home. Therefore, blowing holes in David's clever plot to cover everything up. So David then hatches a new plot in which he now decides, he sends another message back to the general and says, in the next battle, when the battle's raging, just step back from Uriah so that he's on his own, which the general does, and Uriah is killed in battle. Uh, you know, in one sense, I hear this story. So we have this king, this man of immense power. He has access to sort of, Im- like Israel at this particular point is, is getting towards its strongest in its history. It has huge power in, in the region that it's in. David has multiple wives and concubines in, and let's not go into the ethics of that right now, but he looks across this, this rooftop and he sees this lady, someone else's wife that he wants. And he comes to her. It's interesting that that often it's referred to as David and Bathsheba's adultery. And I wonder if that's just people using polite language for church. Because when you read the story, this powerful man making demands of this woman, you kind of feel this is kind of leaning more towards a story of of, of rape or, or, or something in that sort of category. And then this woman remains pregnant and she kind of gets bashed around in this story without any consideration of what is she encountering and dealing with in all of this. And then the story blows up and now it's a murder story. I mean, forget the Bible. This story sounds like the sort of plot line that you'd expect in something really misogynistic like James Bond. God's beloved king 
is how he's often referred in the Old Testament, that David is the king that God loves. And yet in this moment, we find him lusting, raping, lying, deceiving, and murdering. Of course, the story doesn't end right there. In uh, 2 Samuel chapter 11, the verse, uh, chapter 11 ends at verse 27 with this huge understatement. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. No duh. Uh, so the Lord sent Nathan. Nathan was the prophet in Israel at the time. The Lord sent Nathan to David. He came to him and he said to him, there were two men in a certain city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had very many flocks and herds. The poor man, he had nothing but one little ewe lamb, which he had bought. You guys are cold. There we go. <laughs> I, I kind of wonder about this story. Like imagine, imagine, you know, wandering into to Trudeau's office and saying, I'm here to talk to you about your economic policy in Alberta. <laughs> and I'm going to begin with, I'm going to begin with a story about a little sheep. <laughs> or, or tweeting Donald Trump back a story about a little sheep that will help him understand how his behavior is going. It's like Nathan comes in and he turns the emotional dials up to 11. And like in all of this chaos, like what possesses him to come in with, I've got to adjust this story for this situation. So the man brought this sheep up, Nathan continues, and it grew up with him and with his children. Oh. And it used to eat of his meager fare and drink from his cup and lie in his bosom. It was like a daughter to him. Now, there came a traveler to the rich man, and he was loath to take one of his own flock or herd to prepare for the wayfarer who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared that for the guest who had come to him. Come on. There we go. I'm going to try to live in this story for a little bit here. Then David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. Now just think about this, the story that he's told. Think about where David is at at this particular moment in his life. Isn't it interesting how so often we can, we can deal with and behave in particular ways and yet we, we can bury that so deep within us that we think it's dealt with, but then it's, it's like a pressure cooker of sorts and the steam is trying to get out and, and David's anger starts to be, you know, this guy stole a sheep. Like how is David able to be angry at a sheep stealer when what he has done is literally still re echoing in our ears in this particular story. But David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. He said to Nathan, as the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die. And this is what you call a blinkered opinion. He, had, he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. And this story has gone exactly as Nathan intended it to. Nathan is a master storyteller and he is really happy because now he del des delivers his line. You are the man. And David hears this story and somehow isn't able to, to you know that point where you're, you're hearing a story and nothing triggers in David's mind to go, this is sounding slightly familiar. You know, nothing as David's hearing this story is he thinking, just sounds like something I did once. I should politically be careful in how I answer this. But David sort of is able somehow in this blinkered position to rage against this, this little lamb killing man, but not figuring out what he has done. And despite that blinkered view and the complete contrast of this story, he then proclaims that the man deserves to die. The story unpacks a little bit more from there as David and Nathan talk to each other. And David says in verse 13, to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, now the Lord has put away your sin. You shall not die. It's really interesting how David wants to, wants to kill a man who stole some sheep. And yet Nathan just points out that the Lord is not going to deal with you the same way that you wanted to deal with someone else. And Psalm 51 then is, is shaped as a sort of poetic response to this story. 
And I wonder sometimes when I read Psalm 51, and perhaps as you heard it read this morning, and now we kind of put the story behind it, uh, underneath it, and we say, well, maybe this story isn't just this story, but maybe this story is all of our stories. David's life in its time was quite unusual. Uh, David had a life that, that in his context and in his day would have been abnormal, but a life that's actually quite familiar to those of us who live now. David essentially is a freelancer. He is in control of his own choices. He is able to live his own life as he determines based on what he thinks he should do. His finances, his behavior, his social standing, his friendships, his opinions are all matters of his own choice. And that might, that might say, well, that's pretty normal. That doesn't sound overly remarkable to suggest that somebody would be in charge of their own finance and behavior and friendships. But in David's time period, it was probably only the king that really had that sort of power and ability to do that. Everybody else finds their lives pretty well laid out for them without much by the way of choice. So we read this story of a king and should find a lot of resonance into the way that we work out our own lives. What do I want to do today? But how often are we then, perhaps overwhelmed by those options? There are a lot of options in our lives, but do we find them overwhelming? We have thousands of choices that we could make in any one day, in any one week. There are a million things that we could be distracted by and conditioned by and changed by. But the question I find myself often asking is, with all of these choices that I have, with all of these opinions that I have, is life any better? Is life any easier? Have you ever tried to buy jam? Like, how many choices do you actually need? Like, at one point, is somebody going to come out and just say, do you know what, seedless or with seeds, that's enough. You know, I don't want to know about the sugar content. I don't need to wrestle about where the strawberries came from, you know. And forget jam, what about eggs? Like, there's an ethical quandary for you. You know, do you want economically cheap eggs that were laid by bald chickens in squalid sort of circumstances? Or do you want... Or do you want eggs that were laid by chickens that sleep on satin? <laughs> it's your choice at breakfast. You can have value or guilt. <laughs> and that's just <laughs> silly things. <laughs> but what about the more serious choices in our lives? How do we make decisions about our environment? How do we make decisions about immigration? How do we make our political choices? What do we do with our economy? Those, those aren't any narrower. There's thousands of opinions and thousands of choices, and how do we make these decisions? Because all of these new options generate new problems for us. And when you're free to make your own choices, the question that becomes most important that runs in David's life as well as in ours is how should I behave given that I can pretty much do whatever I want? What choices should I make? And I think because we're permanent multitaskers, we find ourselves stretched over multiple options and multiple opinions. It's quite difficult for us as contemporary people to find the sort of internal coherence to our lives. What is our guiding light? What is it that shapes us and helps us decide how we're going to choose particular things? Kierkegaard calls this freedom's dizziness that you may get freedom, but with freedom comes a whole host of other new and different things that might not be what you expected. And potentially, I think what we find ourselves in in our contemporary world is that we become fragmented as people. We're not really sure what voices we're supposed to listen to. We're not really sure what opinions we have about certain things. We don't know how to turn down one choice over another choice because there's so many options. Instead, we end up just kind of as fragmented people which I think is why I find this psalm resonates with me so often at different points. In verse 10 of the psalm, David says, Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Early in verse 2, he said, Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from sin. And I think it it, it resonates with me because this this verse thing, Create in me a pure heart. Create in me a non-fragmented heart. A not falling to pieces. A not pulled 100 ways. Now, often what we do with the language of purity in the Bible is we kind of simply think about it as purely being clean. We think, okay, it's just to do with cleanliness. But purity is much deeper than that. Purity also speaks to consistency and content. If somebody said to you, this is pure gold, you're not necessarily expecting it to be clean, but you expect its consistency to be not fragmented. You expect it not to be watered down with something impure. And the fragmentation from David, I think, is obvious and familiar to us. 
He, he realizes here that he needs something new. And partly the reason that it seems to be that he needs something new is because of how quickly he fell apart. One moment he's on a roof, just enjoying a nice evening. And then there's lust, and then there's adultery or rape, there's then lies, there's then deceit, there's then anger, there's then murder. His internal structure just rapidly exposes itself as entirely deficient. He can't make good choices. And, these, and his inability to make good choices gets worse and worse and worse till he's making terrifying choices. So when I read this psalm, I think it's helpful sometimes not to simply think about the language of purity as simply cleanliness. In fact, the word cleanse in verse two is exactly the same word in Hebrew as the word pure in verse 10. And the purity speaks to this notion of consistency. So David's not actually simply saying to God, clean me up. He's not saying just wipe the slate clean and give me a new start. Because David's confession is deeper than this. Because I think if you read this psalm, he realizes that if you did just wipe the slate clean and start me all over again, I think the likelihood is high that I would end up exactly in the same mess for the second time. So David wants God to go deeper with that. He says, instead of just giving me a clean slate, I think you need to do some reconstruction work on you. There's something needed created in me that has steadfastness to it, that has consistency to it. David realizes there's a functional problem with how he's making decisions and that he can't just simply think himself better if he got a clean start. And you can see the level of this functional problem, I think, in the story that we tell, because he doesn't seem to appear very guilty until he gets caught. He's able to listen to this story of the little cute sheep and be absolutely livid at the behavior of this person in this story without apparently processing his own behavior. It seems that he only feels guilty when he gets caught. And isn't that so often the case? We talk about guilt as if it's a feeling that we get because we've done wrong. But how often is our guilt actually a feeling that we get that we might get caught from doing wrong? You can run this as an experiment quite easily in contemporary society. When a cop pulls you over on the highway, why is it that you feel bad? Is it because you were speeding? (laughs) Or is it because the cop caught you speeding and now you have to pay a fine? And the answer to that will be philosophically revealed to you by how you drive away from the meeting with the cop. (laughs) David's question in the psalm seems to be, what if there's a much bigger problem here than simply guilt and shame? What if it's not just an external problem that I'm suffering with, but there's something internal going on, something that David describes as sin? In verse three, he says, I know my transgressions. My sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. By the way, do you notice how he frames this conversation just here? (laughs) Against you only have I sinned? Oh, wait a minute, David. I kind of feel there's a slightly longer list than that. (laughs) I'm just gonna throw it out there that I feel like Bathsheba has like, it's pretty bad what you did to her. And, And... you killed her husband. <laughs> Against you only have I sinned? Like, what about Bathsheba? What about Uriah? What about the victimized and the exploited and the used and the broken and the neglected? How can David say that he has only sinned against God? And I think it's hard for us to often relate to what David's saying here because we have a tendency to see sin and bad behavior as the same thing. So we talk about sin and we talk about the bad things that we do and we say, oh, well, sin is the bad things that you do. Now, it's very easy to do that, and you'll find that is the way that most people regularly talk about sin. They say sin and bad things, it's all the same thing. But what that does is very subtly transitions how we have conversations about sin, and it moves the conversation about sin into an ethical conversation. It becomes a conversation about behavior. It becomes a conversation about morality. And that then allows us to do something that we love to do, which is rank sins in some sort of order of priority. Like, well, no one will know about this sin, so that's not so bad. Nobody got hurt with this particular thing, so that's okay. And everybody else is doing it, so, you know, how can that be wrong? People Magazine some years ago produced a, a syndex where they, had, uh, they, they surveyed their readers and had them kind of categorize sins in order from worst to best. And as you would expect, that murder, abuse, rape were, were ranked very highly, at much higher than kind of things like CD piracy and swearing, because, you know, they're, they're definitely not really a big issue. 
But this is a far too small understanding of sin. For David, David understands that sin is not an ethical issue. Sin is a theological issue. And therefore, because it's a theological issue, it's not about the things that we've done against each other. It's about what this thing says and who it's directed to. And for the Bible, sin is always directed towards God, which is why the Bible's never that interested in the size or the intensity or the impact of sin. Because sin isn't measured biblically by all of those things. It's measured by who it's against. And so when we judge our sin against somebody else's sin, what we're actually exposing is that we've forgotten how sin works. We've forgotten that sin's not about how big it is or how impacting it is or how intentional it is. It's about the fact that sin gets in the way of our relationship with the God who loves us. Which is why Paul says in Romans, he says that all have sinned and fall short of God's glory. It's not about how big it was or how small it is. It's the fact that sin has separated us from our God. And of course, let's be honest, we don't like talking about sin. It's kind of uncomfortable. You know, we're going, hey, it's summertime, David, like chill out. Uh, We were here for something more about ice cream and the story about the lamb, that was a good place to start. But now it's gotten a little intense. Um, We don't like talking about sin. And my suspicion is that one of the reasons we, we don't like talking about sin is because it's a spiritual issue. And our society constantly tries, we've said this a lot this year, but we'll keep saying our society constantly tries to keep all of our conversations in a non-spiritual context, even within religion. So what we do then in secular society is we don't want to talk about sin, but what fascinates me is that we love talking about what's wrong. You can walk into any polite conversation and start a conversation about what's wrong with the world, what's wrong with your country, what's wrong with your society, what's wrong with your neighborhood, your street. All of these things are perfectly acceptable to talk about. But the problem is we're then often talking about ethics and morals rather than what actually theologically might be the problem beneath the reason why everything is wrong. And so in secular society, we talk a lot about what's wrong, but never theologically. So our conversations about all of these things get moved from theological sin conversations over into conversations that happen within the sciences. So our conversation about Greece, greed, not about Greece. Talk about that another time. Our conversations about greed happen in the form of economics. Our conversations about our own selfishness often are worked out politically. And our conversations about guilt are pushed towards psychologists. Now, I'm a big fan of therapists. I I think we should all think very carefully about what they can do for us and how they can help us. But your therapist can't give you forgiveness. Your therapist can't deal with your guilt. And unfortunately, what we've done in contemporary society, by refusing to have a spiritual conversation, we leave certain problems still present because you can't think them away. You can't deflect the need for forgiveness. The psalmist realizes this. He says, you don't delight in sacrifice or I would bring it. You don't take pleasure in burnt offerings. There's not things that I can really do that actually make any difference. And in verse 17, my sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart you, God, will not despise. We need to come to a point where we realize that the internal fragmentation of our lives needs to be admitted to that actually there's a brokenness between us and God that has to be dealt with. And that comes in the form of a beautiful prayer that goes something along the lines of, God, help. I'm a mess. Bono, our theological res- theologian in residence during this psalm series, says this, coolness might help your negotiation with people through the world. Maybe. But it's impossible to meet God with sunglasses on. Perhaps we say it in a different way like this. In forgiveness, attitude matters. See, because there's different types of ways to ask for forgiveness. There's a sort of false pseudo-forgiveness, which is actually revenge, uh, where you go claiming that you're seeking forgiveness from someone, but really it's an excuse to air your problem with that person as to why there's a problem in the first place. Or, or perhaps you've been in the sort of situation where you go to someone with an apology, but your apology is a very carefully crafted cruise missile which is designed to extract an apology back from them. And I don't know if you've ever been in a situation where you went to someone to say sorry and they've not said sorry back, which I realize it is rare in Canada, but... <laughs> but they've not said sorry back and meant it. And you walk away livid, like I can't believe I apologized to them and they didn't apologize back to me. 
And if we're brave enough to realize it, the reason we're mad is because our apology wasn't real, because it was a sort of pseudo apology. There's also a sort of victim mentality that can happen, which, which is where we, we, we blame everything and everyone else and therefore refuse to take responsibility for our own behavior. Now, there are victims in the world that need help and that need our care and our compassion. The difficulty is when we all insist on playing the role of the victim, it actually sort of makes it easier for to, us to ignore the, the actual victims out there. But our own victimhood that we sort of take on and don because it's a way for us to sort of wear it without having to deal with our own wrongdoing has become increasingly common in our world today. And when I read this story of David and I read this psalm, I find myself thinking how much I need people in my life, people who I trust, who can tell me that I'm wrong. People that I believe have the best interests of me, that Nathan comes and he wants to save David. And the only way to do it is to point out, David, you're a mess and you're trying to deny it. I feel like we all need that sort of Nathan character in our lives, that person who will step into the mess and say, you gotta get out of this, but you gotta take some responsibility if you're going to. But how we respond to that seems to me to be hugely important. The psalmist mentality in Psalm 51 is to openly admit to the mess and the brokenness. But the beauty of his ability to admit to this mess and brokenness is that there's a deep reality that he's clinging to in the midst of this. There's something he's rooting himself in. And it's, it's given to us right at the very start of the psalm. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. This is the Bible story. It's not just the story of Psalm 51, it's the Bible story. Before we get to confession, before we get to ask for forgiveness, we know that God's love is unfailing. It precedes everything. And this, this idea of loving kindness, this translated in this version as the unfailing love, well, I, I wanna talk to you a little bit more about this next week, but for now, let's just simply say this. This Hebrew concept of unfailing love is the love that ensures that the relationship is never permanently broken, even when your behavior suggests it should be. And so it becomes the one thing that David is confident in, that he knows that God's love will supersede anything that he does. And this at some level is the gospel sown into the pages of the Old Testament, that God's unfailing love precedes everything. The psalmist knows that God's love is greater than any mess he can make. This, of course, then means that the psalm works sort of backwards for us. It's not how we would expect the psalm to work. It's not how we expect confession to happen. Confession normally precedes the apology. We confess and then we say sorry. And then if we've done well, if we've done a good job of confessing, if we're believable in our apology, we might get the forgiveness. But in the Bible, it all works backwards. Theology works backwards throughout the whole Bible because what we constantly get is grace, then confession. In fact, if we're really honest, most of us encounter God in such a way that we only figure out there is a need for confession once we've experienced his grace and his loving kindness. We meet it first. And this for me is a really important thing in terms of how we talk and educate ourselves as a community. Is that how we talk about the gospel? Is that how we talk about God? Do we talk about the God for whom the first thing we can say is that his loving kindness is unfailing? The first thing we can say about him is he'll never give up on us. I sometimes want to talk, and if I can be really specific for a moment, I often want to say that to parents. How do we introduce our children to God? And so often what we tend to do, and by the way, a lot of Christian children's books don't help you with this. What we do is we begin with the problem. So we go, hey kids, you're terrible sinners, like all humans, and you're five. <laughs> and all the bad things you've done have made God really mad at you. And then now we're gonna tell you some other stories. We'll tell you about Daniel and we'll tell you about David and we'll tell you about Esther and we'll tell you about Ruth. And then we'll finally, if you're still with us, we'll tell you about Jesus. And so our kids live in this sort of created guilt about a mess that they've made and we don't give them the answer. And what we do is we build the whole story of here's the problem and now here's the answer, which is never how the Bible works it out. How the Bible tells us the story is here's an answer. See if you can figure out what the problem is. 
See if you can figure out what's gone wrong. Paul meets Jesus on a Damascus road thinking everything's fine. And it's only once he's met Jesus that he figures out, goodness, I was a mess. If you found Christ as an adult, you probably, if you think really careful about it, were first drawn to his grace and then you figured out what a mess life had really become for you. The biblical story works from answers backwards. The cross becomes the lens through which we see everything. What is it Paul says in Romans 5 and verse 8? While we were still sinners, that's when Christ died for us. This whole story is working its way out backwards. My favorite writer at the moment, David Zal, says this, the good news is that nothing that needs to be done hasn't already been done. You see, as the psalmist realizes, you don't repent in order to get forgiveness. Grace will always get to you first. I kind of feel like this is why we need God. This is why we need God, and we need a community that understands that that's how God works. Because, like, we're going to make a mess, right? You're going to make a mess. I'm going to make a mess. And we're going to need grace. And that's kind of why we need God. People say to me a lot, I don't know if you have these sort of conversations, maybe it's just because when I tell people what I do with most of my life, this naturally happens. People go, yeah, you know, I don't really need God, I don't need religion. Do you know what Christianity is? Right? Christianity is just, it's about loving each other, being kind. Have you ever had that conversation? I always want to reply to these people, and, and I'm trying to work up the guts to be less polite, but I always want to reply to somebody when they say to me, eh, religion's just about being kind. This is what I want to say to them. And how are you doing with that? Now, how's that going for you? You know, that being kind all the time and loving one another always. Is it working well? <laughs> Acing it? <laughs> the reason that we need God's loving kindness, the reason that we need God's unfailing love, his grace, is because I, I'm tempted to say that even if all that was required of us was to love one person well, we would undoubtedly fail. So we have these Psalms, 150 of them, and they're the songbook and the prayer book of the Bible. For some reason, somebody said, hey, do you remember that time that David did that terrible thing to Bathsheba and then, even, and then, and then killed her husband? We should sing that song a lot. <laughs> That's a really good one. You know, so let's, let's put it there and, uh, and we'll sing it. <laughs> they're in the Bible. Why? Well, maybe because the Bible is the story of a God who is the God of liars and the God of thieves and the God of adulterers and the God of murderers. And these people might also be kings. Which means then, surely, that he's also the God for the broken and the angry and the abused, the victimized, the exploited and the scorned. He's a God for the drug addict and the bankrupt, the politician and the engineer. He's the God for the happy families, but also the broken families and the lost families the single dads, the teenage moms, the orphans, the widows, the lonely, and the outcast, the hopeless, the anxious, the depressed, the hyperactive. Because grace says that God's loving kindness and unfailing love towards you isn't defined by any of that. So may you, like David, find it to be true that God's loving kindness overwhelms all of your excuses not to come to him. May you learn that you don't need to go to him to achieve forgiveness, but that he has forgiveness and it's waiting for you. And may his grace and peace be with you this week. God bless.